So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Sophia. I'm a second year engineering science student and today I'm introducing Professor Chris Bomeister, whose preferred pronouns are he, him, his. He's an assistant professor teaching stream in biomedical engineering in the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. Professor Bobister has a background in mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, and cardiovascular physiology, and he studies the effects of waves created by the heart and mechanical assist devices. He's currently focused on teaching engineering design, meshing inverted classroom structures with hands-on activities, and measuring the psychophysiological response of people in active learning environments. Going forward, Professor Bo Meester will offer a completely online course. His presentation today is called Using Digital Whiteboards to Achieve Collaborative Learning Activities. Today's session will be recorded. Um, and yeah, please welcome Professor Bo Meester. Uh, thank you very much, Sophia, for that uh, nice introduction. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining me. I see the numbers trickling up here. And um, today I wanted to talk about this thing called the Digital Whiteboard and how I used it for uh, what before was a very collaborative course in one of these teal rooms, technology enhanced active learning rooms. And so really I was trying to think of how I could recreate that uh, in a virtual space. So uh, quickly what I'm gonna go over a little bit is sort of why I chose these digital whiteboards uh, then, you know, give you some examples of, you know, what I did. And, you know, then there's the, I think the, the fun stuff is, you know, I've made all the mistakes doing these uh, uh, digital whiteboards. Uh, and so, you know, maybe we can make some more mistakes if I can share the link uh, to a, a Miro board that I've created. And so then we can actually play along and you can maybe experience some of the mistakes. Uh, I've tried to give you a streamlined experience, but there's still room for things to go awry. And so maybe you can actually play around with this for a little bit. And uh, then maybe there's uh, an opening for discussion, how you might use it for your courses, or I'm happy to answer any other questions that uh, you have. Okay, so the main reason I used a digital whiteboard, uh, my main duty is teaching capstone design classes, but I actually didn't use the mural board for that. Um, I had a, one of the main courses I taught in the fall was a graduate level course where they're all thinking about their own independent research projects. And they've got to share their ideas, get feedback from students. So normally uh, in class, we're doing all sorts of exercises, pairing up with other students. Really, it's beneficial for all these new graduate students to even meet the other people that are coming into their program because they're going to see them for the next two to five years. So instead of just sort of puzzling over something in your own mind, trying to work with other people, get feedback, help you um, put your, your puzzle together. Uh, another good thing about digital whiteboards, it, it actually turns out it's easy to take snapshots of the work that was done. So you can imagine in our teal rooms, you've got all the whiteboards on the perimeter of the room. Uh, I guess if I wanted to capture all the things that people are doing, I'd have to go wrong and take pictures of everything. Uh, if you're doing a digital whiteboard, it's the artifacts are all kind of there and uh, it's actually easy to go back and, and look at what was done. And it's actually a good way to, you know, if here's my little icon for you send people into their breakout rooms, and you kind of have to jump between rooms. Uh, you can set up one of these digital whiteboards. You can see everybody kind of working at once and it's easy. It's kind of like gather town. You can zoom in and zoom out for different areas of the board. So uh, maybe backing up a little bit, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about what digital whiteboards are, if you haven't heard about them, give you a couple examples. Maybe that gets you thinking about what you can do. So uh, digital whiteboards, you know, I, I point you to, here's like sort of the two big names that I came across. Uh, the platform that I actually used was called Miro, and that's their little icon there. So you can go Google Miro and do all the tutorials. Um, there's also another one called Mural, uh, and you know they both have their their free versions. 
in the end, I really chose Miro because it was easy to get the educator's discount. And I think I got pretty much near full functionality. I can invite up to 100 students. And so by going through their little approvals process and getting that academic discount, uh, it, it unlocked all the features I needed with Miro. And I, th I think Miro also has a educational discount, but some of the features weren't there. I also like Miro that it had a, a desktop application that I could download as well. Um, but you can do everything just online as long as you've got an internet connection. It's all on the cloud. Uh, so really anything, you know, a traditional whiteboard, uh, doodling things with markers to put in up post-it notes and rearranging stuff, it, it kind of recreates that kind of atmosphere in a nutshell. So I don't want to drown on too much about what they are other than anything that you can do in sort of a, a on a good old fashioned whiteboard you can do with a digital version. And so really it's aimed to have lots of people working on the same space, uh, moving things around, analyzing them, uh, sharing notes, things like this. So let me instead give you a couple examples. Uh, you know, here's a good old fashioned mind map. Uh, so, you know, this is pulled out from one of my activities with the grad students. They have their own research question. I have a framework called the finer framework. And so then they break down their question and, you know, is it feasible? Is it interesting, novel, ethical, relevant? And so, you know, there's a template there that allows you to, to pull off different um, uh, kind of legs of this mind map. And you know anybody can type it in, anybody can draw new connections, things like that, move it around. It's all very user friendly in that respect. So you know there's sort of the basic thing that uh, one can do. Uh, another thing I did, you know, students compare different research proposals, and then they look at the, you know, was the author appealing to your your mind, your heart, or sort of someone's credibility. And then one thing that you can set up is just have these little dots and then you move the dots around and that's kind of how you vote. Sometimes, you know, this is kind of like a design sense. You have like 10 little dots or, you know, old fashioned way, you'd have little stickers and you'd go put your stickers on something that you'd vote for that you like. So students went around and they kind of mapped out, you know, on this little triangle where a proposal might lie and then they could circle out where their kind of averages and that could lead to their discussion, moving dots around. Uh, maybe one of the things that you might experience when we do the link here and play around with this is if you give everybody the power to be an editor, it's easy to move someone else's stuff around too. So, you know, there can be a little bit of chaos to these activities. Uh, so here's a, an example of the good old fashioned, you know, you've got you throw a pile of sticky notes in the class um, so I would give a kind of a, a static background slide. This is just sort of a risk analysis table. The, the text might be a little bit small here. And so I could give um, kind of any kind of matrix or anything and people could have their notes and they could paste them and move them around. Uh, and so they could discuss where you have to put the notes. And what you can't see are these little tags maybe i should do the laser pointer version here you can tag all of these uh, sticky notes with your own name mainly this is also helpful when i talked about taking snapshots about stuff you can capture all this you can easily download it you can take all the sticky notes tagged with someone's name and reorganize them somewhere else so that's where some of the features of the digital whiteboard go beyond what's kind of maybe somewhat cumbersome to do in the real world, you can re easily copy things, reorganize them instead of manually doing that sort of the old fashioned way. So anybody can post their own little note. Anybody can tag it with multiple people. Um, so that's kind of a classic example. You know, that's what you're doing in these brainstorming sessions. And I should say this was taken from another grad class that I have that uh, is looking at the human factors of medical device design. So this is maybe more of a design class where you need lots of these collaborative activities to analyze different designs and get feedback and discuss these things. And I, I should say, you know, when I'm, I also utilize uh, 
a breakout room. So I'd put students in a breakout room so that they would have a channel to discuss. And then they've got this mural board that they're working on as well. Uh, and, you know, a, another example, I think the last example I have before I get on to doing some more fun things, you can also do the old, you know, mark things up. You can, so here's a, an exercise where I had students sketch uh, toast, uh, getting them to think about how they're making their visual analogies for their own research proposals. Um, and so you can create a little doodle really easily. If students have got tablets, it's probably a little bit easier to do with a pen and paper, but you can use the mouse. You can post your little doodle. You can have other people mark it up as well. And you can share things. And so these are just some examples of uh, toast created by different students. And then, uh, you know, this is kind of a couple stage. So I'd say, give me a portrait of something. Okay, can you turn that into some kind of graph or a timeline? or flow chart and so you can iteratively do this you can mark up somebody else's image uh, collaboratively as well and uh, thanks sophia for um <laughs> posting the, the link again there um and i'm just looking at some of the chats and the comments uh yeah susan i i, I can imagine miro would be uh uh, awesome for architecture. It would be very powerful to to have those critiques of whatever architectural model or or things like that, or even how you're mapping out your concepts. And uh, yeah, we, we we can have some some future Picassos doing Miro as well. And I should say, you know, I was even thinking of I, I've seen people do Dungeons and Dragons on Miro. You could copy the game boards and have all your friends on a Zoom channel and move the pieces around. Um, I, I was thinking of getting my daughter and uh, my dad, her grandfather, to play chess, and you can move all the pieces around, things like that. So there's there's lots of fun things that people are probably doing with Miro as well. Um, so you know the most obvious thing maybe something that probably anybody could do is do it for an icebreaker if you're doing things virtually um, you know so uh, the simplest icebreaker is really just create like a little profile card um, post up your picture if you feel comfortable uh, you know who you are what you're interested in and allow students to sort of be able to see what their classmates look like so that's kind of a, a simple icebreaker just create a little profile of yourself um, what I did wasn't able to capture with my screenshot here is then you can make comments on other people's uh, on their little profile card. You can post uh, comments on, I guess, any little feature and and then you can see who commented. They say, oh, that's interested, interesting. I, I'm also researching that same area and then you can have all these little channels of conversations going and so you get a lot of back and forth there. And so that, that's what I was really hoping on creating for this graduate class is it's also a place where all the new graduates have a chance to see people they wouldn't otherwise meet. And so uh, those little commenting features going back and forth are also uh, a, a nice feature as well. Uh, so here's a heads up. Uh, I think everyone's in the room and got that link to Miro. And so I, I'm either going to melt down your bandwidth um, because I've chosen a, a Miro board with lots of little things. And on my end, I can see that there's a bunch of people here. And so everybody's on there. I think some people are playing around, uh, creating stuff. Uh, looks fantastic. Uh, so if you haven't used that Miro link yet, here's kind of a another um, heads up to, to, to use the link, get on, sort of get familiar with how things are going. And so while you're playing around there, he, here's kind of some of the lessons that I've learned. Uh, instructions really help. And so everyone's kind of, I've, I've set the screen, so you've gone to the instructions there. And, uh, you know, I've said, go play around. The next thing that might be useful for you is that one has the option to hide all the cursors. So if there's a bunch of cursors flying around like crazy, it can be really distracting. There is the option to turn it off. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm still sharing my slides right now. I, I can't sort of toggle back and forth really easily, but uh, usually at the top of your screen, there's that little blue 
uh, cursor icon, you can toggle people's icons. I could even use my God powers of the creator of this board and take all your cursors towards me and I can direct your attention if I really wanted to. And you can also find people as well and you can see what they're doing. So, and then my third point is, you know, I've moderated this so far by hiding a big panel below here. So what I'm going to do now is expose the panel below and here's my icebreaker activity way for us to play around with Miro today. And so that's also why I gave you the link a little bit earlier is there's a lot of stuff on this Miro board. It might chug along a little bit, might take a while to download depending on your connection speed. And so then, so these are all mistakes that I've made. I, I started off not having instructions and then it's just utter chaos. What the heck do I do with these boards? And then students are super frustrated. Um, at first, uh, you know, even right now, I'm going to hide all your cursors because it's it's just like crazy and it maybe even slows down your, your bit connection as well. Uh, that was kind of a mistake, not hiding those. And uh, having everything available at the beginning and not moderating things by hiding these frames just causes people to maybe do things that you don't want them to do. And then having a structure is really important. So I've also now got instructions uh, for the activity again, uh, people are already figuring out what they're doing. Um, because you have the powers of the editor, it's easy to move stuff around. So right now someone's got a big coil that uh, got oversized. Uh, it's easy to drag stuff around inadvertently. Uh, people are drawing stuff. I actually have the ability to lock certain parts of this board down so that you don't inadvertently move them. Uh, so yeah, that's a really important thing is that you need to uh, lock some things down. You, you might have experienced, you, you, I mean, you can move the text, you can move all the boxes, you can move all these things. It can become chaotic if they get moved inadvertently. So all the stuff that people are playing around and using right now are things that I haven't locked down. And you can even have the ability to copy other people's stuff and paste it onto your own side of things. Um, and so my other comment with the structure is I was looking at the attendance for some of the sessions earlier and I'm going, uh oh, there might be more than 10 people. Uh, so I expanded this little board here way onto the left in case I had 20 or 30 people and there wasn't enough room. So if, uh, if I see most of the people are working off on the left there, if you need to expand, I've got some expansion frames. So for example, I could moderate and I could unlock more of these little portrait panels, more little name tags, more little uh, shapes that kind of look like old fashioned tape. And I've also got, I kind of duplicated everything off to the right as well. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm kind of pleased to see some people are you're kind of exploring off on your own. Um, my main tip is, you know, when you're using Miro or if you want to use Miro, start off with something easy, like just create a profile card. It gets people used to the interface. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different options. It can be overwhelming at first. Even just sort of navigating sort of what you maybe might do accidentally to somebody else's work. It's it's good to start with something easy to get people into the system so that you can sort of do more advanced things a little bit later. If you're doing a more advanced, you know, you could do a jigsaw activity, get people to move around the board. Uh, I, I wouldn't do something like that right away. Uh, the other important thing is, you know, have sort of some activity. I guess this is with any activity. You never really want students to be sitting around with nothing to do. Uh, it's nice if you have sort of ways for students to keep on working on something rather than just sort of sitting around not doing anything. So I think everybody's kind of ahead of this slide. Uh, this is the monster maker activity. So I think everybody's jumping ahead. That's fantastic. I, I'm looking <laughs> at your mural board right now. Uh, like everybody else is probably looking at their own desktop. Um, so, you know, the, the, 
this, the instructions are pretty simple. Create a monster. I've got all these different monster parts. You can click and drag them over. You can copy and paste them over. Uh, I think everybody's done a good job of naming their monster. We've got uh, twig monsters, ed tech monsters, very apropos. Um, and so there's those other little icons. You can show some love. There's sort of a thumbs up icon. There's a little heart icon. You can copy and paste some of those. So right now I'm going to paste a, uh, I'm going to give some love to the ed tech monster there. Give another heart that looks uh, good there. And you can see if you accidentally move one of the icons from, from there, you know, it's kind of disappeared. So it's easy to see how things can become chaotic if everybody's moving stuff around that maybe they shouldn't. So it does take a little bit of work as maybe me, the moderator, to maybe put things back in their place, maybe delete stuff that's that's gone uh, a little bit overboard, uh, maybe replace some stuff. Maybe I have to replace the little chili marker there um, so other people can see where that is as well. So I think everybody's created, you know, here's an example of go send people off by themselves, go make a monster, do some kind of task. And then the, the second part of this activity, which a lot of people have jumped onto, is uh, let's get these monsters to play around together. So you can copy and paste your monster. I've shown kind of a little example that I had to begin with. And you can copy and paste your, your monster and create a scene uh, right there. And we can kind of see how they might interact. Uh, so the, the other thing that I, uh, actually a, a new feature for uh, Miro here is I can set a little bit of a timer. And so maybe let me check the time here, 322. Maybe I'll just set like a two minute timer. And I, I'm curious to see if the music comes through on your end, I'm sure you can mute it. And so there's my timer to kind of give you some nice chill background music. I don't think it's coming in on my end for some reason, but it, it was before when I tested this out. And so you could set up a timer in Miro so it keeps people on track. Like, okay, I've got two, five minutes left to do this. So let's say for here, you've got another two minutes, minute and 30 seconds to, to put all your monsters on the collaboration station, um, match them together. If you're happy with what you've created, And uh, yeah, so one thing that uh, I'm seeing too, it's also easy to sort of inadvertently draw lines. Uh, so that's good if you need arrows to connect things with each other, but that's one of the things where it can become messy. It's easy to, let's say, click on somebody's design and click on one of the, the little connector parts. Uh, so it's, it's great that it's easy to draw lines and make connections. Uh, it's also easy to inadvertently draw connections uh, as well. So, you know, there, there we got about 30 seconds left to put your monster. Uh, the, the other thing that's tricky to select as well, sort of getting used to these things is uh, it's, it's kind of like a PowerPoint. You can group things together. Um, selecting them is a little bit tricky for me. I think I've got some of the, the pro tips there is uh, you know you kind of have to use the shift uh, button while you hold down the left click and that allows you to select multiple things. Um, so you, again, getting used to the activity uh, by doing sort of some simple tasks is kind of important there. And yeah, so there, there's time up. I got a little ding. The last thing that I can do is show you a feature on, so now everybody's got their monsters in the collaboration station. You can, like I showed before, I had all these little dots and you could put dots on, you know, what is your, your favorite design. What I'm gonna show you is a vote. So I've created a voting session already. And on my end, what I'm doing is activating uh, in this little collaboration station. 
So now what I'll do is use my God powers and I'm going to bring all the, bring everyone to me. So you should be pulled over to the collaboration station. And what I'm going to do now is start a vote. So for two minutes, you should be able to click on different parts of the images for the, the monsters. And you can, let's say, vote for your favorite monster. So I, I've given everybody five votes. Uh, here it gets a little bit tricky with here's maybe doing too much with this particular activity. There's lots of separate little images grabbed together. If you just click on uh, a monster kind of in general or one of the little plus symbols, you'll vote for different features so you can click away and you can zoom in and out on just this one little area of the board and you can vote for your favorite monster so and you can vote more than once so i really like that little red monster so i gave him a couple votes and so everybody should be seen on their own end uh, who they're voting for and there's a little voting session panel uh, and you can take away your votes and sort of re-vote before the time is up and so now the, 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 the timer is you've got another 55 uh, seconds to vote. And you can click done whenever you're done voting. And we can, uh, when you're done voting, you can have access to the whole screen again. You can go back to that. Um, so it's kind of an interesting way to, to get some feedback. If you've got something that you need feedback on, you can vote for certain aspects. Uh, there's kind of a built-in, easy to set up feature. Um, you know, it, so and then you can program ahead of time. Do you want to just vote for sticky notes, for shapes? You can vote on different aspects of text. You can arrange all this on the back end. And so I just wanted to to do that so you got a, an experience of voting through Miro. And so my timer on my back end is counting down. And now I can see the results. So I think me as the creator of the board on my end, I can see the results and it takes a little bit of time to process. See what chugs out at the end. And for Miro to chug away, I don't know what's taking so long. I get a little display here that says 15 people. The, the, the top monster is the little red fuzzy one in the middle uh, with the little crown. And I, I can see, uh, you know, from the whoever's running the design session can get that feedback and see who's uh, voted for things. And yeah, it, maybe what I'll do is skip ahead in my presentation and give you some of my final thoughts. Uh, and, you know, riffing off Solomon's point there, you know, yeah, this also burns down my little university provided tablet, <laughs> uh, Microsoft service tablet. So some of my final thoughts are, yeah, you're, is this really going to depend on how much bandwidth you have? Uh, and really, you know, I had a student in Iran and it was only after the class they told me they couldn't get past some firewall in Iran to, to use the Miro session and they never really told me until the class was over. So that's kind of hopefully one thing that you've experienced is how slow this can be just because it uh, bogs down the bandwidth. I did get a little bit of feedback. Uh, my question to the students was uh, how much they valued the activities and, you know, most agreed. Uh, a few strongly agreed, uh, two disagreed that they, they valued the activities in Miro um, for this for these graduate courses that I ran. And, you know, yeah, maybe that's me throwing it back to you. I, I know, again, I, I, I've probably gone longer than I anticipated, uh, so I don't know how much of a discussion they'll will be able to have. But uh, yeah, throwing it back to you. Uh, hopefully you've got a chance to experience a little bit of Miro yourself. And then it's, uh, I'd be curious to see if uh, anybody else might use Miro. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.